so anyway. Let's get into it. <laughs> um, I've actually been wanting to share my story for a while now. For no other reason than just to share it, I, I need to get it out. And you know, there's not really too much opportunity in terms of speaking to people that are here at the moment because it's a burden on them too. It's difficult to talk to people you love about these kinds of things because it, 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 it weighs down on them as well. And writing, I guess writing for me has lost its magic in terms of this, in terms of journaling and having to deal with this daily disruption. And so here I am <laughs> making a video. I also thought since you know, I am making other videos and there will be long gaps in between it was easier just to tell everyone why so today I'm going to tell you why I think I think let's let's begin where I was diagnosed. So around um, 2011, 2010, 2011, oh, <laughs> I moved back to South Africa and lived with my mom and my sister. <laughs> so yeah, I um yeah, I, I moved back to South Africa about that time and I had I had been living in Italy just I don't know, <laughs> dealing with the fact that I was undiagnosed with all sorts of symptoms and all sorts of kinds of people telling me it's in my head. Oh, in your head. Now, if you're someone who's <laughs> ever been diagnosed with a chronic illness that is rare, or something that is difficult to detect or unusual to detect it's it's very likely that at some point in your journey someone told you <clears throat> that it's all in your head and mind you it won't be a psychologist or a psychiatrist that says it it will be a doctor of some speciality and they will refer you and you will, you will constantly go back and forth and this does have quite an effect on a person so I had hoped in Italy I would find some answers I found no answers and that sent me down a very very dark hole lots of sadness and after consulting with the doctor this side he suggested that i move away from the city he felt that city life and the smog and the stress just all of it was too much for me it's one of those <laughs> fragile ladies you know, live in the country because of my weak constitution <laughs> 
But you know, he was right about that. I don't do well in a city. <laughs> Never had. Um, so yeah, anyway. So he tells me to find a way and at that point my sister had been assigned to a hospital in Nelspreet, which is, it's not a city, but it's not a village, it's a town. It's small but you know definitely resembles some decent country living symptoms did not get better in fact during this time symptoms started getting worse uh, <laughs> and I mean some of the symptoms are incontinent some of them were retention issues and some of them were you know, full body pain, but yeah, there's a, that's a whole other video on its own. So a lot of, quite a variety of symptoms going on, but the, the main one, which started when I was a child, was the, <coughs> was, um, well, bladder control issues, so I would either wet myself or just not go at all. And this lasted for many, many years. To the point where, to this day, I still have problems. I don't always know when I need to pee. And that can obviously cause quite a bit of damage if you're not urinating correctly or regularly. So this went on for many years and at this point in Nelspreet I started having severe abdominal pain. Uh, <laughs> this is a kind of pain that I don't wish on anyone or would even know how to describe because it is it's beyond my understanding of pain. It is beyond my comprehension of description as there, there is no other way to describe it than pain. It is just whatever the pure essence of pain is, that's what that was that day. And it was in my stomach. <laughs> I could not walk, it was bad. So my mom took me to the ER where I met a doctor who was very curious about my bladder issues and referred me to a urologist. I managed to help me with my pain. And uh, after a few hours, I went home and we booked an appointment with the urologist. And so I go to the urologist a few weeks later I must say, probably one of the better doctors I've been to. He checked everything and he couldn't find anything structurally wrong. And I explained to him that many people from a young age told me that it was in my head. I remember when you wet your bed as a child, there's a lot of other reasons for what it could be. And the, the doctors at the time when I was a kid believed that my incontinence issues or my bladder issues were due to emotional distress which I was emotionally distressed but it's probably likely due to the fact that you know I grew up in the 90s and things were a little weird <laughs> you know so you know I explained to this urologist that I I had always been told, you know, it's in your head, it's in your head. Uh, you, you know, just stop, you know, just, uh, you know, stop getting yourself all worked up by it. At this point, I was 20 years old, going to turn 21 that November, and that was the September of 2011. 
So, after checking and checking and speaking to this doctor, he came to the conclusion that I was of fairly sound mind and that there must be something other than, you know, just emotional distress. The symptoms are almost exact from when I was a child in that case. Um, so yeah, we, he decided to send me for an MRI scan. He booked me for a thoracic MRI. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was on a Friday. I believe the date was 26 September and I, I had been for quite a few other types of scans, CT scans and whatnot, but never an MRI. So I thought, you know, I was only starting work at 10 that morning, MRI is at half past 7 in the morning, so I'll just go to work afterwards and I'm not going to take the day off, you know. <laughs> I should have taken the day off. I kept me inside that machine for an hour. The radiologist conducted the scan of my thoracic spine and yeah the nurse once it was done the nurse came in and she told me that the radiologist needed to be sure that what he was seeing was accurate so he did the test again then the nurse came back in and said we need to check one more time but with contrast now, for those of you who don't know what contrast is, it is, um, you know, a, a dye that goes into your veins and then it allows the radiologist, I believe, to see leakages and all kinds of other things that are happening within your veins or arteries and so on. Like a, a minor leak, I believe, is what they were looking for. Um, and so I'm, I'm assuming like most other countries, the radiology didn't really say anything. They just told me that the doctor would be in touch. Oh, I've been through routine tests quite a few times at this point and I was not worried because I figured that they would just come up inconclusive as every other test has done like <laughs> but that afternoon when I was at work I was closing up I got a phone call directly from the urologist mm, that is quite unusual doctors don't normally phone their patients directly unless they really have to so that was quite alarming. It was not his secretary to tell me the results already. It was... It was him. And the first thing he said to me was... The first thing he said to me was, "You, um, <clears throat> we found a growth on your spine. gross on my spine but they're unsure what it was there there was something wrong and he didn't understand it so he booked an appointment at a neurosurgeon for me I had to go that Monday
little did I know at the time that having an actual growth on my spine would have been better than what was really wrong. My mom and my sister went with me to the neurosurgeon's office. Um, radiology had sent the scan straight to him because they were part of the same hospital. So three of us were sitting there waiting for the neurosurgeon to come in. And this is the only time a doctor has never greeted me when he walked into the room. He walked in and he put the scans up and turned around and said, who's the patient? It's like, it's me. It's little old me. And he looked under the, under the table and he looked at me and he said, from these scans, I was expecting you to be in a wheelchair. <laughs> um, a wheelchair? I mean... Of course not. You can still walk. You can do things. I'm fine. Why would he... Why would he care, you know? So, the doctor went on to explain that what I have is syringomyelia. Well, I'll put that on the screen for you. <laughs> so yes, syringomyelia. To be exact, idiopathic syringomyelia. For those of you who don't know what idiopathic means, that's just a very fancy way of saying we don't know. <laughs> it's I have this disease or I, you know this condition, syringomyelia, with an unknown cause. All right. So what is it? What is it? What's what is my prognosis? What do I do from here? It's the first time I've had evidence of any disease and I don't know what it is, I don't understand it. He explains that in basic terms that the cerebral spinal fluid in my spine has expanded creating a syrinx shaped cavity in my spine and I happen to have three cavities throughout my spine cervical, thoracic, lumbar And normally they, there is a reason for it, quite a large amount of pressure um, or associated illnesses like Chiari malformation tend to be the cause. It's no confirmed Chiari, no hydrocephalus, no vascular leakages, no tumors, no post-traumatic events. Nothing. I just have it. After explaining this, um, after explaining this to us, he explained that he cannot help. 
Though he had seen many cases of syringomyelia, they were almost all post-traumatic. After car accidents, mostly. And he straight up did not know how to help. That was it. Uh, he told me that he's going to refer me to a neurosurgeon in Pretoria, which is three hours away, driving. Maybe he can help. <laughs> so I said, Doctor, is this genetic? He said, I don't know. We don't know. Probably not, but maybe. Okay. Doctor, can you tell me anything? <laughs> no. <clears throat> yes. So at this point we were home and had lots of mixed emotions but mostly relieved. Um, it meant I could start the new chapter in my life. I could continue on to treatment and management, figure something out. But yeah, in the end I I learned that you know I, I learned that there is no cure and there very likely is no way of me figuring out how or why this happened to me it was concluded by many neurosurgeons and other professionals that I basically just make my own decisions <clears throat> in terms of pain and symptom management so I have which has led me to the life that I have now this lifestyle is a big part of why I can be so free, why I don't have the daily stresses of before. This lifestyle gives me a routine. It gives me something to focus on and it gives me little goals. It gives me things that I can accomplish. That's not overwhelming. It may seem like a way too simple life to most people but this lifestyle has has allowed me to be a person I started this channel because I wanted to share that with other people I wanted to share the joy, the satisfaction, she said the outright feeling of being alive <laughs> that this lifestyle gives me. Yes, there are hard moments, there is hard labor. I do need to ask for help for a lot of things. I can't pick certain things up. But I am stronger than what I was seven years ago. I can walk up a flight of stairs without huffing. I don't cough up blood every morning. I don't throw up every day. These are major achievements when you have a body like mine. But I figured there'd be no point in <laughs> there'd be no point in sharing this lifestyle if I didn't share some of the other part of it. There will be times when I don't do videos for a month and it's likely because I'm not doing well. I'm having a flare up. And there'll be times where I'll try and do videos as often as possible. And there's no point in hiding it. It's a huge part of my life. So much so that 
it's not really something one can hide. So but let's just jump into it in the beginning. And we talk about it and we start talking about it. Because I, I would like to help other people in similar positions. Similar illnesses to find their way. To find a way to feel motivated. To find a way to do something that they can be passionate about. It's not easy. There's lots of limitations and you have to be aware of them. But it doesn't mean everything has to go. So I guess for this video I'm just sharing my quick diagnosis story. <laughs> that was the day I was diagnosed with idiopathic syringomyelia and that's partly what brought me to this lifestyle. I've always had an affinity towards it, I've always known that I wanted to live on a homestead one day, at least in retirement. I enjoy this simple way of doing things. I do. I hope that you enjoyed having a little background for me. And if you have any questions, do feel free to ask them in the comments. And I know it can feel like you might be asking some personal questions. Just use a little discretion and you know, don't be afraid. I will answer what I am happy to answer in the best way that I can. I'll leave it a few links in the description as well to a few places where you can go look up Syringomyelia and get a better idea of what it is exactly if you would like. But I will do further videos and you know, explain. A little bit of my journey. If there's any particular aspect you want to know about first, do let me know. <laughs> yeah, that is how I was diagnosed and I hope it has given you a little bit of insight into me and I hope that you will be able to find some motivation in it to stick to whatever you're doing. Things aren't easy, but they're doable. Yeah. Till the next time.